Hi folks, Park Howell here and welcome to the Business of Story. I got something special for you. I have a brand new ebook launching this week on February 28th at Social Media Marketing World in San Diego and it's absolutely free. It'll make you a master storyteller as we cover the five stages of grief in telling your business story. You can download it at businessofstory.com this coming Wednesday. So, where do you fall in the five stages of business storytelling grief? Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, or acceptance? Download your free ebook at businessofstory.com and start living into your most powerful stories. I thought it was just a stupid picture of a pig in the ocean. But after hearing that story, I had to have it. Now I wasn't just buying a picture. I was buying a story. The story literally made the picture worth more money to me. That's what businesses are about. People buy brands. People buy stories much more than anything else. I work with a lot of big enterprise companies, but let's just say I always tell folks, drop the PowerPoint, close your laptops, start with your story. If you want people to get engaged and you want people to act, you have to tell them an emotionally powerful story. That's with great characters, it's with uncertain outcomes, and it's with high stakes and drama. All business strategy is a story. So there I was, standing on the stage, kicking off social media marketing world last year in San Diego. We had, I don't know, upwards of like 800 people in the room. It could have been 1,000. It could have been 8,000. I'll have to get Trump's people to give me a final number on that. But it was exciting because it was a jam-packed room, and we got into the session, and people were into it. We were working through their story, you know, working on story structure. And there was one gentleman I met for the very first time, and he's our guest today because he really stood out to me. He's a guy that embraces story, helps people online really understand how to simplify their story and get their act together. I mean, this guy has got quite the credentials. When you think about it, when uh, Inc. Magazine, Entrepreneur Magazines named him one of the nation's top youth marketers and branders, he's got a really interesting process called the 313 method that we are going to examine today. And I am looking forward to all of that. But what I'm looking forward to even more is an ebook that he and I have collaborated on that is coming out this week, just in time for Social Media Marketing World. Again, we're going to launch it from the stage on Wednesday, the 28th, as I once again get to come back for my third time to do a business of story training to help you simplify your story, to amplify your impact. Well, our guest is Ryan Fullen. And if you know Ryan, you've seen his work online, especially on Twitter, where he has a way of doing these wonderful little doodles that tells a simple story in a single frame that are fun, engaging, endearing. And they look so simple, you're like, how could that possibly work? And if I was to try to do the sketches that Ryan does, I mean, I would look like I'm in the third grade again. He just has a way of pulling it off. In fact, when I was doing the presentation last year, he was in the crowd doodling away, took a shot of it, put it up on Twitter, I think even before my session was over. So I got completely endeared to him. And then when I started looking at the work that he has been doing around the world now, um, it's just I had to reach out to him and say, Ryan, are you interested in doing an ebook with me? And much to my honor, he said yes. So we have that book coming out this Wednesday. You can find it at businessofstory.com. And it's called The Five Stages of Grief in Business Storytelling. How to Overcome Story Fright to Grow Your Leadership, People, and Organization. And he's brought his masterful doodles to this five-chapter book just to help you become explicit, simple, fun, interesting storyteller. And that's what we're going to talk about today, Ryan's work in helping people simplify their brand stories, and especially I'm interested to review his 313 method. So without further ado, Ryan, welcome to the stage here at Business of Story. Ahoy, it's so great to be here. And I have to warn you because you said a lot of nice things, and it's very dangerous to make a ginger blush, all right? <laughs> 
It's red on top of red. Is that what you <laughs> Yeah, saying? it's a double down on red, which is different than if you're putting a couple hundred bucks on the red in Vegas, but still the same element. There's a lot of energy, <laughs> a lot of potential going on. But yeah, no, I'm, I'm super excited to be here, and I think story – Telling uh, is something that shouldn't just stop at the campfire, and I, I really love your effort in helping people to get slapped across the face and work through the the fear that they have of maybe thinking they're not a storyteller because at the end of the day you are. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, you mentioned this this flushing of the face, so I got a question for you because it actually occurs to me. Ryan, whenever I get on stage, no matter how many times I've done this presentation, and it doesn't matter if I've got an audience of eight or 800 or 8,000, I don't know what it is in me, but I like well up and my face turns bright red. And, and, and I'm not a ginger, but I do have you know red, red in me. And I'm just saying it takes over and I can feel it flush. And then my, I guess, nerves and my adrenaline goes away and it finally calms down. So if you are there, on Wednesday at my workshop, you're going to see me flush at the beginning, but I don't know what that is. I, it's not just a ginger thing. It's oh, me. I know what it is. Well, let's first clarify what a ginger means. You said that you're not a okay. ginger, and I, at the end of the day, believe being ginger is a state of mind. So everyone <laughs> can be ginger, and because we're like the most underrepresented minority out there, I think secretly we are the strongest because everybody's got a little flush in their face. Everybody's a little red. Everybody's a little bit of, uh, every, you know, again, it's it's not just the color, it's the state of mind. So for the first few minutes, you're a little ginger on stage, and that's good. But I do have an answer, and I know why that's happening to you if you're interested about the backstory. Absolutely. Bring it. All right, so you are afraid of getting eaten by a bear. Mm -hmm. And this I actually cover in my first TEDx talk, and it's called How to Not Get Chased by a Bear. So your brain has gone through an evolution. And some people refer to the beginning as this croc brain or the mammalian brain. And it's focused on keeping you alive and not dying. Real, real simple baseline, right? So your subconscious is what's connected with that part of brain. And it is constantly evaluating your situation for dangerous objects, dangerous animals, dangerous people, dangerous situations. And when you step on stage – you are looking at the audience and your subconscious is reacting as though on a physiological level, like this is one big bear or there's 8,000 bears that are about ready to pounce on you if you do anything out of order. And one thing that you actually might do is you actually might freeze, like actually feel some sort of paralysis. And that is because in nature, the things that move get seen, <laughs> okay? And that's why you always lose your car keys is because they don't move. They might be right in front of you, but they don't move. So going back to why you're becoming flush is because there's a series of, of, of hormones and enzymes and um, things that release inside of your body so that you have extra blood that goes to the important parts like your extremities so that you can run as fast as you can and uh, run for those three minutes to get away from the bear or the cheetah, whatever's chasing you. And what you'll find is that after a certain amount of time, you're, you realize, wait a minute, this is not a bear. These people are not bears. They're here to see me. I'm in social media marketing world. This is great. Okay, I'm enjoying this. I'm loving this. No more threat of a bear. And that's when you sort of calm down and then you get into it and then you just crush it on stage like I've seen you do a couple times. Oh, well, thanks, Ryan. I, I appreciate that uh, description. I think you're dead on, by the way. And you can set, uh, send your invoice to my payables <laughs> people as soon as I get off the couch. The funny thing is when I'm up there, I'm like everybody, I think I have nerves before I go up. I know I do, a little butterflies, you know, keep you honest to get up there. But it's like this adrenaline takes over and I'm like, blah, 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 blah. I don't stand still. I probably move and talk faster than I should until like I'm three minutes into it and I take a deep breath. I'm like, okay, now we found our pace. It is just so funny. But I think maybe that off. movement initially is actually your body trying to really like run away from the bear. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and the, the challenging part is right now in this day and age, an email from your boss's boss can be a bear. Somebody cuts you off on the freeway can be a bear. Your mother-in-law can be a bear. And so our body is reacting to situations like there are bears that are chasing us. So the inside jumps into action. But if you actually don't exert that energy, it just sort of works against you on the inside. So um, I'm always a big fan of people helping to identify the bears in their life so that they don't have to ch they don't have to run from them. They don't have to hide from them. Yeah. They just realize they're not bears. Yeah. You know, one of the 
greatest pieces of advice I've ever gotten on that when you're thinking about the butterflies and stage fright and that sort of thing came from Peter Bick, who was on Business of Story. Peter is a documentary filmmaker. He's out here at Arizona State University, has done some really cool things. And he made the point on the show one day, you know, if you've got butterflies, when you got to get on stage, it means that your ego is taken mm. over. And the way you switch that, and it works every single time, is switch your framing from you to your audience by doing this. Simply say, I am for them, and no matter what I do on stage, I want to make sure they leave with this. And all of a sudden, what it does is it reframes it out of your ego. So now you're not worried about how you look and if you you know, race around or if you get all flush red at the beginning of it, because it doesn't matter. The bottom line is, are you bringing and adding value to your audience? And I thought that was one of the best tips I've ever gotten. So when I start getting nerve, I go, oh, that's because it's all about me. I need to refocus and say, no, it's about those folks in attendance here. I love that. And to add on that, I've got a good buddy, an amazing speaker, John Bates, and it's similar in what your friend's talking about, but he talks about it in a way of selfishness. And that the reason why you're nervous is because you're selfish. You're selfish that you might say the wrong thing, that you might get sweaty armpits, that you might mess it up. And if you take this approach, what you're talking about, the, the cure to that selfishness is selflessness. And like, you have to be selfish for the audience. And it is interesting that the more anxious and nervous you get, if you really look deep, you're probably just selfish about how you're going to look and how you're going to sound. It to- absolutely. I mean, I, to me, that is a total truth because uh, once I switch that framework, then I get it. Now, you've done a lot of speaking. You're doing some really fascinating things in communications, and you're doing it in your own way. That's what I love about what you're doing. Um, Take us to a moment in your life, a scene, if you will, that has shaped your personal brand, you know, who you are today, Ryan, and how that character trait is being expressed through your brand. And so this moment may have happened when you were a little kid or when you're in high school or whatever, but can you take us there that says, this is when I knew that I want to do what I'm doing right now? Yeah. All right. So here, let's set the scene. (laughs) Going back in time. Uh, And I really think it's when I started my first business uh, on accident. Uh, So my family, we're big into Christmas lights and we put as many lights as we can on the house and the boat. And then we always put a few more. And I'm the youngest of three, and so they'd always send me (laughs) up the ladder. And I'll never forget, it's this 24-foot extension ladder with two sections, and when you pull it all the way out, it's almost 50 feet. And as a kid, (laughs) I remember I was actually very excited about it. So I'd climb up and, you know, slow and steady to get to the top, and I was armed with a staple gun, and uh, I would have, (laughs) you know, uh, Christmas lights in one hand, a staple gun in the other, and I'd be trying to get you know as much uh, coverage as I could before I'd have to go all the way down and get the ladder and move it to the next. And I was reaching out like almost to my the, the stretching point to no more limit, and then I heard this familiar voice straight down below. It was like, Ryan, I need your help. And I looked down, and it was my neighbor, Mrs. Kawaguchi, and she always wears her bathrobe. She's got, like, matching sandals, and she's squinting at me because it's sunny. She's looking up, and she says, uh, you know, I need your help. I'm like, uh, I'm a little busy, Mrs. Kawaguchi. And then she said, I'll pay you. Be right down. <laughs> so, you know, I'm 10 years old at the time, so I, I'm, I'm following the money. And I talked with her, and she basically said, look, Ryan, I've got a problem. I can't put up my Christmas lights and not even anywhere close to as good as you guys do. And so I said, well, I can solve it. And she said, okay. And then that's when I started a Christmas light hanging business that I actually was successful with all the way until I left for college. And I only had to work the one or two weeks during Thanksgiving break. And I never had to work for the rest of the year. I made enough money during that time. Um, had a lot of customers, but I'll never forget the $386 that I got in cash from Mrs. Kawaguchi. And I remember at the time, uh, instead of saving it, (laughs) I decided to use it as investment capital to fund my different inventions. Um, I, at the time, was working on a calculator stand so that you could type on your calculator without holding it, and you could actually see it, the the old style calculators. And then uh, I took old wetsuits and I made shoes out of them and I called them water booties because I was convinced that it was so cool to just walk in and out of the water. You never had to take your shoes off. And one that I really thought was going to be a big hit was uh, my new bookmark 
So I did a lot of reading, but the thing that really, really irritated me is I'd finish on a page and then I'd go back to it and I wouldn't know exactly where I ended. And I did a lot of like double reading. So I created a bookmark with an adjustable arrow that you could actually point to the exact word. And so you never had to reread anything again. And uh, <laughs> I remember that summer I went door to door trying to sell my, uh, you know, my calculator stand, the water booties and the bookmark. But nobody cared. Like <laughs> nobody thought it was as cool as I did. They just pat me on my head and, and send me on the way. And I ended up with too much inventory and not enough sales. And that, that story alone I think sums up like who I am as a person. Uh, I have no fear of uh, you know, stepping up onto a 50-foot ladder with a staple gun trying to make sure to, to spread Christmas spirit around. Um, I'm always looking for opportunity, uh, listening for people that uh, are around me and, and, and thinking about what I can do to help them. And at the end of the day, really, this idea that she had a problem and I was able to solve that problem. That is really the crux of what I teach in communication about this 313. And later on in life, I had this epiphany and I, and I really attribute it back to her, you know, pitching ideas and things like that. It's that people don't care about what you do. They only care about the problem that you solve and they really care about the problem if they or someone they know or someone they love has that problem. And if th that's it. So like I live my life as looking for problems to solve or solving problems for people that have it. But all the other minutia, like I know that people aren't going to be interested in and I'm able to focus my time on solving problems that I can solve. And that's that's really like the heart of the 313. So and you're starting at the 10 year old age, the, the rightful age of 10 years old. <laughs> your brand is the problem solver, yet you come out with three completely different products, calculator stand, water booties and bookmarks. Well, they were, they were all solving real problems, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Ryan, what problems are you solving then? Well, I'm going to even pick apart what you just asked me because you asked me what problems I'm solving. And I'll go so far as to say that I'm only solving one problem. And I deal with a lot of people who feel like they're solving multiple problems. But if you are solving more than one problem, it's very easy for people to throw out your entire solution because you don't solve 100% of what they need help with, right? So the one problem I solve, the single, individual, biggest, burning, bloodiest, craziest problem that I'm solving, the fact that people cannot communicate their ideas in a way that make people want to care in a short amount of time. That's it. So whether that comes to uh, your actual pitch for an idea, whether it comes to communicating your brand, whether it's an individual social media post, whether it's um, communicating via email to a university-wide audience, I solve the single problem of people not being able to communicate effectively in a short amount of time. And that's really like what gets me so excited because it's, it's, it's the Mrs. Kawaguchi problem that I think is the most underserved and has the highest impact because if you can really say less, get people more excited about what you're doing, it's just the world opens up. So how did you come across this problem? Where have you seen it in action and you know that, oh, I got to be doing that? So I – was an entrepreneur from age 10, which we got going. And I've had a colorful past, been in anything from everything to and then some more. And my biggest issue looking back is I was probably more of a chicken with my head cut off, but I've got it focused now. And, and a big focus of that was when I got recruited to run a brand new entrepreneurship center at the University of California, Irvine. And what that did is it gave me a chance to be in front of thousands of entrepreneurs who pitched me thousands of ideas thousands of boring ideas. <laughs> and and these are student entrepreneurs. These are student entrepreneurs, yeah. yeah. So I feel like they had the same problem that I had when I was trying to pitch my water booties, my calculator stand and my calcu and my uh, my bookmark. Is that you know, these students are pitching their ideas but no one's listening. And so that really was when I I got excited to to double triple down on solving the problem. Because again, I said this and I'll say it again, people don't care what you do. They only care about the problem that you solve, and if they have that problem, then they're interested in what it is that you can do to solve it. And so at UCI, um, it was 
it was an amazing opportunity. And within 18 months of the program, we had over 2,400 students that had started businesses. We had 15,000 mailing lists from the community. We were crushing all the metrics that a new program would have on campus. And I did a lot of it in a guerrilla tactic. We had uh, we made a Snapchat ghost that we would hide in classrooms. We used all the elements of social media as they were developing and coming out. I was making seven-foot paper airplanes and throwing them off the top of the student center and then getting strictly reprimanded a number of times for a number of these tactics. And then at one point, I got called into my boss's boss's office, and it was pretty unannounced, and I had a weird feeling about it. So I went there, and I sat down, and um, it was awkward, and the big boss looked to my boss and said, you want to start? And the other one was like, no, do you want to start? And I was like, well, somebody fire me already, <laughs> right? And <laughs> Get it the big, way. big boss like, well, we've seen what you're doing and the stuff on social. I'm like, I can explain. I can explain. He stopped me and he went, no, we really love what you're doing. We don't really understand it, but we love it. No single program at the university has gotten so much traction in such a short amount of time. So we actually want to promote you. And we want to put you in charge of 27 different programs on campus that work with undergrad students. I'm like, okay. <laughs> 27 different programs? How could you possibly wrangle yeah, that? Well, uh, where there's a will, there's a way. And this comes back to the problem because the problem I solved at even this, uh, this center, the Entrepreneur Center, because we're the ant eaters, the problem was communicating what we did in a short amount of time. Uh, the success with the students solving their problem of helping them to, to craft better pitches to communicate what they do in a short amount of time. And it, it really all is, is amazing how it all tied in together. And, and we can, I can show you how this, the 313 fits into all this. But at that moment, like when, when you think you're going to get fired, you kind of have a moment where you're like, wait a minute, what if I did get fired? And I realized that all of my time, all of my investment was into the students, the university, the branding of the program. I had none of that for myself. And so that's the moment, the single moment when I said, you know what? I, I need to be building brands for other people, but I need to build my own brand. And that's where I made that conscious decision. At that time, I had 200 followers collectively on all my social media accounts because all my effort was with the program and, and not by myself. So I ended up uh, at Keith Frazzi's house for this exclusive entrepreneur uh, party that they had going on. Keith Frazzi, if you haven't read his Never Eat Alone book, amazing. He's just brilliant when it comes to connecting with people. And at his house, he made people not talk about what's going right, but he asked for people to talk about what was going wrong. And, and why is that? What, what's more important about the what's going wrong? Side? Well, see, everybody, especially like when – you're around people maybe that you're meeting, you're networking. There's this tendency to be like, oh, yeah, things are great. Things are this. Things are great. And if, if Park, if I have a conversation with you, I'm like, oh, my God, I'm crushing it. Things are awesome. Things are so sweet. Like everything's good. You're going to look at me and go like, cool. Well, that's great. I don't think I can really help you out. If you always lead with what's going right and you basically put on this facade that you don't have any issues, then you don't open the opportunity for people to help you. And with candor comes real connection and actually being honest about the things that you're struggling with is an open door for people to be able to help you. And that's how you connect. People want to help each other. So it was amazing where you have all these very successful people, but they're basically sharing what's not going right in their life. And I was saying that what's not going right is that I'm writing, I want to talk, I have all this content, but nobody is reading what I've written. Nobody, is, nobody knows who I am. And then another gentleman who happened to be the only other person in a bow tie – Mine was knitted, believe it or not, and his was velvet, believe it or not. So both kind of interesting characters. A knitted bow tie. Yes. That I've got to well, see. It, okay. it was a student startup. And what they did is yeah. they, they knitted bow ties. And uh, Lincoln was one of the first major figures to popularize the bow tie. So they make these bow ties. They put them on a, on a head of Lincoln, like a stub of Lincoln, for a certain amount of time to get the Lincoln-esque. <laughs> and then they sell them. Very kind of cool, right? Cra crazy students. <laughs> All right. So Leonard and I had a chance to sort of meet and I said, well, you know, it was my turn. I said, well, I'm having a really hard time with people knowing who I am and I have all this amazing content, but nobody cares. And he said, well, I have, you know, 10 million reads on my content, but I have a very hard time getting up in front of a crowd and, and speaking dynamically. I said, well, I can, I can help you with that if you can help me with this. And he's like, okay. And then the funny thing is, uh, we actually hung out a couple times 
and we, we really learned from each other. And then we got serious and I said, well, I want to build my brand. Can you help me? And he said, well, how about you do this? How about you write a list of everything that you know that you need to do, everything that you think that you need to do, everything that you want to learn? So I spent a couple days, like an exhaustive list, and I gave it to him. And then he – And what were the kinds of things on it? So um, things like I need to know when I write a blog post, what do I do with it? Um, how do I effectively re reply to comments? Um, what should my social media background banners look like? Um, what should my, my bio look like? How long should my bio be? Um, you know, all these different elements of like things that, you know, like how do I get people to like my stuff? How do I get them to share it? Like I didn't know that. So he took all that information, rearranged it. And that was the foundation for the curriculum that is now our sort of bread and butter, uh, influence tree personal branding course. And I became our first student and became business partners with him and basically found out that I was doing the right stuff just in the wrong order. And he was able to look from the outside view and say, you need to do everything in this order. And then I did things in that order and now I'm sitting on close to 300,000 from a following standpoint. Um, I've been featured in all these publications. I've been speaking around the world. People know who I am. I'm confident. I can have a clear messaging of what my brand is all because of really – being vulnerable at the moment when I met somebody to say what I needed help with. So that's at the end of the day why it's important to to not always have this front like everything's amazing because right. people don't have a chance to help you out. Well, and you think about it, story is not about all this amazing world around you. It's about the difficulties you're going through. I mean the best, the greatest story structure of all time is man gets in a hole, man gets out of a hole again. People love that. Story. <laughs> exactly. So, you start in a hole, say, here's my problems. How can you help? And then folks are always so generous in, in doing that. Well, what was the linchpin? So you went, spent two days pulling together all these different tactical things that you're trying to arrange and prioritize and figure out. And Leonard helped you do that. But what was the linchpin to get down to your focus? What, and I think is so ironic about this is you were a guy whose singular focus is problem solving and yet your greatest problem sound like you didn't have a singular focus for yourself. Yeah, and, and I talk about this in my second TEDx talk where I go through the story of actually meeting Leonard and almost getting fired on campus and he really helped me go from you know a chicken with my head cut off because I was all over the place. And it was, it was when I realized that I needed to hone down my problem solving into one problem that that was the linchpin. That, that was the linchpin. And I asked myself these two questions. When I'm presented with an opportunity, does this make me money and is this on brand? And if the answer is yes to both of them, I do it. And if it's – So how did how did you though end up on your brand? I mean you, you know, that first question is can I make money at this? Yeah, I really can. But really the second question is more important, isn't it? How is it on brand but how did you focus your brand? I took control of my own narrative and what I mean by that is that everyone has a personal brand whether they know it or not. And this is something I give talks on a lot, especially to students and people who are interested in sort of upping their exposure, right? Is that I believe your personal brand is already in existence. It's what somebody describes you as when you're not in the room. But I really feel that the true brand, the value of branding is in the intersection between what people already think about you and what you want to be thought about as. So we actually have this exercise that we had developed in my sort of process of trying to figure this out and we call it our post-it note process where somebody who's trying to really lock in their brand – and you can do this at any point. It's not like uh, you've missed the opportunity and it's even a good check-in every once in a while. But what you do – and if, if we we're going to run the exercise with you, I'd have you go get two colors of post-it notes and first I'd have you write down on individual post-it notes all the different traits and qualities that you would want to be known for. Um, as a, uh, the person that you are. So he's a great storyteller. He's a great speaker. Uh, he's a motivator. He's funny. He's all these things that you want to be known for. Keep going. <laughs> and then you go out to everybody that you know, like people who are your friends, your family, some people that really like you, some people that are acquaintances, people that you've done business with. And you ask them the same question. You say, can you describe me in one or two, maybe three words? And you leave the direction at that. And then you collect the post notes that are anonymous or you can do it digitally. You can have a friend that they all send emails to and you collect all these. And if you do it digitally, I still think you should write it on a post note. 
So you can get in front of a big whiteboard or a, a screen glass door works well because it's post-it stickiness. And you put all the post-it notes up there, two different colors, your ideas and their ideas about you. Then you start to group them together in similar traits and qualities. And you'll find some, there's some outliers, right, that have no connection. Then you'll have groups of, of things that are what other people think about you, groups of things of what you think about yourself. And then the magic circles are those where it has both color post-it notes, at least one post-it note from you and from one of your friends or whatnot. And that's really the, the, the crutch of where you get to choose your branding and control your narrative. Let's say that there's five different groupings, five different traits that people think about you and you think about you want to be known for. Now the idea is to only choose three of those. And <clears throat> one of those has to make you human. And the reason why it's three is because three is a magic number. Not only is it my numerology number, uh, and it's my favorite number, but how many blind mice were there? Three. How many bears testing porridge? I was running away from three of them on. <laughs> how many little pigs? Three. Okay, so three is a magic number, and it's easy for people to digest, and it's just like ingrained into, into our society. And so I tell people to count like this, one, two, three, many. That's it. So One, two, three, I, many? Yeah, that's it. What's one, two, three. That's it. It's only one, two, three. Everything else is not a number. Okay. Many. <laughs> all right. So have you ever have you ever met somebody and you're like, hey, what are you all about? What do you do? And they go, well, I'd like to do this and 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 this. And you're like, whoa, you're all over the place. Okay. The reason for three is that when somebody asks you what you're up to, you say, well, I'm all about communication, innovation, and I love to sale. That's what yours are. Those are my three, communication, innovation, and sailing. That's what I lead with. Now, sometimes I could just lead with one of them. If I'm in an environment where it makes more sense to be known as the communicator, I'd be like, that's what I'm all about is communication. Let's talk about that. It helps to create focus on it. So this exercise, other people's opinion about yourself, your opinion about yourself, the connection, where there's the intersection, that's where you can build your brand because it's a lot easier to convince people of something that they already know and people already know a lot of things about you. So what I started to do is really own the communication, the innovation, and you know have fun talking with people about sailing, getting more involved in that. And uh, here's a real-life example. It's actually tied into the social media marketing world because people are getting ready. They're pumped. They're going to go this year. The first year I went, I was an attendee. I was a little overwhelmed. I wasn't uh, in the spot with Leonard where I was really building my brand, and I just got the information. The next year, I was full swing in my own like investment in personal branding, and I was searching on my computer, and I found a folder called Social Media Marketing World, and it had pages and pages and pages of notes that I had taken, but I had done nothing with. And if you've ever done that, it's very frustrating. Like At the time, I was like, yes, I'm going to write all this content, but I forgot about it. So I thought to myself, what can I do differently, and this was last year, Social Media Marketing World 17, what can I do differently to sort of share the information more effectively. And so I left my laptop, I left my iPad, and all I did is I brought my phone. And I created what I call now a TweetNado, hashtag TweetNado. It was an effort of taking notes publicly. So things that interest me, things that I thought were cool, um, elements of your presentation that I wanted to share with people or that I'd want to share, I would tweet it out. And I would tweet it out and tweet it out and tweet it out. And I use Twitter as a way of communicating the stuff that was interesting to me. And here's where a real life result is. So at the very final grand finale, you know, they bring the 6,000 people in and everybody's hoo-ha and rah-rah and it's the final. And they announce the top speakers of the whole social media marketing world. There's 120 speakers. It's a big deal to speak at social media marketing world. Whose name was on top? Number one. Mine. I was named the number one top speaker of social media marketing world for 2017. I didn't even speak. <laughs> they were just because of your, your tweet role? Because of all of the tweets and all of the mentions and all of the activity. <laughs> so, like, so like that's, again, like where I was like, wow. Last year I was a nobody. This year out of 6,000 people and 120 speakers, I was named the top mentioned speaker. That's funny. Why? 
Why? Because I had a focus and I had a drive and it was, it, it was really about communicating what I'm all about. So um, I just took it and ran with it. And, and I've been creating tweet natos from, uh, from New York to Connecticut to Hong Kong to China uh, and even in Haiti. Uh, basically where I go, I use Twitter as a tool to communicate what I'm doing and the value information that I'm seeing to share. And do you go back to your tweets then as kind of a notebook of here's the stuff that was of interest to me and, and are able to then act on it? So yes, and here's the deal. This is you'll, you'll actually really like this because I, I know how you are always getting feedback and that's very important. So Storify, which is actually going away in a few months, um, that's what I used to use. And I would Storify all my tweets and then I would go through and I'd look at the content of the tweets and based on the interaction, likes, retweets, and comments, the audience, the world, basically helped me to crowdsource what the most important information was. And then I would take that information, then I would build it and create talks around it and things like that. So now that Storify is going away, rest in peace, have you heard of the app If Then Then That? No, I haven't. Oh my gosh. Anybody out there, download this app. It's called I-F-T-T, whatever. If, then, then that. I-F-T-T. And it's a applet. Do you know what an applet is? And, well, it sounds like a small app, app <laughs> application. So, <laughs> so applets are small, small applications that connect other applications. So with – Think of a program, right? If this happens, then this happens. It's a classic programming methodology, right? right if right. if then, then that. That's programming. So there's a function where you can say, if I tweet using this hashtag, then put that tweet in a spreadsheet on my Google Drive. Wow, that's so, cool. So you, can, yes. you just capture category – well, curate everything that you're tweeting. Yes. So I'll tweet hundreds of tweets – and it populates in a spreadsheet that has every single tweet super nice and lined up that I can go back to and refer and have as my notes. That's very cool. I'll have to pull that one up. And, and if you're going to social media marketing world, I'm going to create another tweet storm, another tweet NATO. So at Ryan Fullen, feel free to engage and, and, and join in on the conversation. Hashtag tweet NATO, N-A-T-O. Uh, yeah, just like you think. Yeah, so tweet NATO. Tweet NATO, right on. <laughs> so- yeah. So you've done all this. You've clarified your story. I love this idea about trying to figure out how people understand you and see you. You know, I mentioned Sally Hogshead the other day in uh, the show about her fascination advantage assessment of how people see you, which is a really, really fun little survey that you can take and people can learn about how the, uh, the world sees them. But, boy, there's nothing like just going out and asking them point blank. What do you think of me and, and, and taking down those notes? So you ended up at this communication innovation sailing do you end up with a lot of sailing clients then you know what i end up on a lot of sailboats <laughs> ah, which is probably more important <laughs> which is better and honestly it, when it comes to sailing and then racing there are a lot of uh, well-to-do individuals that i am connecting with and and our clients at influence tree is twofold we have these courses that are really not that expensive um, that you can do your own learning and we step you through the entire process and then on the other side of the fence, we work with high-level CEOs and executives. Uh, we've got uh, you know a VP at Cisco. We've got authors that are New York Times bestselling authors, people who own multiple pharmaceutical companies. These people that are amazing at what they do, but nobody knows who they are. And so we come in there and we do kind of a white glove. I like to say throw up in your mouth expensive service. And we create the content. We build the, the social media strategy. We actually do all the posting. We create thought leadership pieces. We get them featured in publications and uh, create video scripts, help guide them on Facebook Lives. Because we can't make people expertise, but we can help to amplify the message that they are experts. Get them focused and help them get their message out to the world. Yeah, so so it's it's a lot of fun with what we're doing. And believe it or not, the 313 is like a cornerstone to our branding process because whatever your brand is, if you just, you know, ramble like a babbling fool, then nobody's going to take you seriously. So let's 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 do a little breakdown for the 313 for those people that are excited to learn more about it because I believe it is a solution for the problem that I solve. So give me a setup. So someone's sitting across from you and they've got the major problem that they cannot 
clarify their story. Is that ultimately what it comes down to? And that's where you plug this in? Yeah, yeah. But let's just take that situation and pretend like you're meeting somebody and you ask them innocently, well, what is it that you do? And they talk to you for 10 minutes, bore you out of your mind, and you realize that you never want to interact with this person again. <laughs> right? right? Like those people, the inability to communicate that idea. So the 313 as a methodology, it stands for your ability to communicate an idea. It could be a business idea or it could be um, your brand. Uh, it could be a product. It could be a service. There's a, there's a lot. There's a big window. But it allows you and gives you the structure to communicate that in three sentences, in one sentence, and then three words. That's the three, one, three. Three sentences, one sentence, and three words. So you're really trying to define your ability, your personal brand. You're trying to grow your influence and just get that totally focused. Yes. So for me, um, think of what I do as being a craftsman of communication. That's my three words. I'll actually, when somebody asks me what I do, I'll just say that, and you can see them think, put the dots together, and then I've shortcut them to catching them up on what I do. The, the, the process is really focused around three core elements, the problem, the solution, and the market. And I hear everyone thinking, Ryan, I've learned that, I've read that in every book, Everybody says that it's not common, it's not, it's not new knowledge, right? Yay, problem, solution, market. But those are the key components. You just got to tweak them a little bit. So the first, the three sentences, is really the meat and potatoes of the process. Can you describe the problem that you solve in one sentence? Can you describe the solution in one sentence? And can you describe the market in one sentence? You would not believe how incredibly difficult that exercise is. <laughs> it's very deceiving. It all starts with this idea of the problem, right? Because if you believe that people don't care what you do and they only care about the problem, then it's the first good litmus test to find out if it's a problem or not. When I ask people or I meet people for the first time, I will say, look, I, you know, before you tell me what you do, can you just tell me the problem that you solve? Don't tell me what you do. Just tell me the problem that you solve. And nine out of ten times, they answer by telling me what they do. And I have to stop them. I go, no, just don't, I don't, don't tell me what you do. Just tell me the problem that you solve. And then maybe they'll tell me two or three problems. And I'll say, stop. Just tell me the one thing that your problem, the one problem that you solve. And so many people have a difficult time articulating that. Have you ever had a paper cut? Oh, yeah. Okay. What happens? What happens with the paper cut? It, you, you, it stings. You get pissed. You're like, "Come on, it's just this little thing." But why is it so annoying? Okay. So imagine if the paper you're using was sharp, more like a knife, and then you actually chopped your finger off. Have you ever chopped your finger off? No. Close. Okay. But no cigar. <laughs> so what would happen if you chopped your finger off? Well, I would jump around. It would sting. It'd be annoying, and then I'd race to the hospital. Right. And you call 911, you get the finger, you put it on ice, you do all these different things. When people try to describe their problem that they solve, most of the time they're describing it as a paper cut or even worse, as a scratch. I was in Haiti, for example, and I had somebody come up and we were doing a live work through of the 313 and I said, what is the problem you solve? And they said, well, electric uh, you know, electricity isn't always consistent to hospitals. Okay, That's a paper cut. So we worked on it and a better way to say the same problem in a way that's more like a finger being cut off is that because electricity is not stable to hospitals, when the power goes out, people die. There's a huge difference between those two. Oh, yeah. And when you when you when somebody I guess, you know, when somebody describes the problem in a way that makes it feel like a paper cut, there's no like whoever's listening, there's no sense of urgency. There's like, okay. Yeah, the problem is the rainforests are being cut down. Okay, what do you want me to do about that? Right? Versus describing it in a way where your finger's being chopped off and it becomes a thousand times more interesting. Because positioning a problem in terms of like serious pain, that's what commands full and immediate attention. And people that hear this, they're going to want to talk to you or they're going to want to learn more about it. Uh, it. It puts a whole new spin on there's no pain, no gain. Because so the what you're saying is people go to the solution before the problem. 
Yeah. And remember, I don't care what you do until I understand the problem that you're solving. Right. That's one psychology of it. But even when you tell me the problem, like you've got to make it so that I care. Uh, here's, here's a really fun exercise that people can do. The next time someone asks you what you do, and it happens all the time, look at them and sort of try to come up with this on the spot and say, you know what? This may sound funny, but it's not really what I do that's important. It's the problem that I solve. And then you stop talking. What do you think they're going to say next? What's your problem? What problem do you solve? Well, I'm so glad that you asked. It's one of the biggest problems that entrepreneurs face on a daily business, a daily basis, especially those that are trying to gain funding. Then I stop talking. Well, what are you going to say? Well, what's that? <laughs> I'm so glad you asked, right? <laughs> so do you see how as soon as you get people uh, engaged in conversation, you're no longer pitching. And I always say that the more you talk, the less people listen, and the less you talk, the more people ask questions. And when you get people to ask you questions, you're no longer pitching. That's what creates uh, connection and curiosity of what you're doing. So when you start with this idea of the problem that you solve, people will be interested in what the solution is. And now they're asking you for the solution. And then you say, well, here's my solution in one sentence. And what is the problem that you solve? The problem that I solve is that entrepreneurs who can't get people to care about their ideas will see their ideas die and they will end up in a cubicle, miserable and depressed working for someone else. And your solution? I've created a system that allows them to explain their idea in three sentences, one sentence, and three words. And the market? Specifically, entrepreneurs who are long-winded at a stage when they need to get actual funding or traction or buy-in from team members. Okay, I had a little bit of a breakup on my end there. Would you mind saying what your market is again, just in case we didn't catch that? Sure. So my market are entrepreneurs who can't seem to explain their idea in a short amount of time, who are potentially looking for funding or traction in the marketplace. All right, so you've got these three sentences, and this is great because you can see how it really starts focusing your story. What does the one then in the method stand for? It's actually mathematics. So if I were to say that there's three different letters, A, B, and C, okay, how many different ways can you combine those different letters? Nine different ways. Meh, try six. Okay, Six I, different I, ways. I have the same problem. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's three factorial, so it's three times two times one. Okay. okay. So now how many different ways can you combine the letters P, S, and M? Six. Okay. So now if P – is the problem, S is the solution, and M is the market, I've given you six different ways of explaining your whole idea in one sentence. And it goes like this. For uh, th I solve this problem by doing this for these people. For these people who have this problem, here's what I do. This is a problem, here's how I fix it for these people. You have six variations of those three things. And Park, if you can describe the single problem that you solve in one sentence and the solution in one sentence and your market in one sentence and those core, core elements, then you can combine them all into one sentence six different ways. So and you have those in your back pocket, so you have these six different ways to describe what you do depending on how the conversation is going or who you, your audience is or what you think is going to be uh, the most catchy way to tell it at the time? Yes, and here's the thing. I'm trying to eliminate the elevator pitch because whenever you hear somebody give an elevator pitch, it sounds rehearsed, it sounds forced, it doesn't sound genuine, and they don't stop talking until they're done. So this idea of the 313 is you can dynamically start a conversation talking about the problem. Uh, people want to know about your solution, and you can tell it to them very straightforward. Real quick on the solution, people will ask you what you do, and most entrepreneurs will answer how they do what they do. The next time you see an entrepreneur, ask them if they can explain their solution in one sentence and they'll just stand there and blankly look at you. But that's because they answer how they do what they do, right? What you do is just like your name. If somebody asks what my name is, I say, my name is Ryan. I don't say, well, back in 1980, my parents were thinking of a name that might be interesting and also intriguing, right? Nobody, people don't care how you do what you do until they know what you do. So when somebody asks you what you do, you tell them what you do and then stop talking. And if they're interested, 
they're going to ask you how it works. So the, the one sentence is a way for you to combine these elements. It's very fluid. It's not like I have them memorized. I know the solution. I know the market. I know the problem. And I can organically twist them six different ways so it's always kind of fresh. Mm -hmm. So then what's the number three in your 313? So it's actually not three words, but it's two things in relationship to each other. It's using metaphor and analogy, and you will be great at this. It is not a tagline. I repeat, it is not a tagline. A tagline is something that sort of is summary of what you do. Um, are you familiar with the implicit theory of 2 plus 2? I don't think so. Okay. There's a great TED Talk by the guy that, uh, that created Nemo and all these amazing stories. And he talks about the implicit theory of 2 plus 2. In a movie, right, and in this story – uh, in the beginning, you're going to sort of throw out a two, and then later on in the story, you're going to throw out another two, and then the audience is going to be thinking, I wonder if it's four, and at the end, you say it's four, and they go, oh my god, I knew it, I knew it was four, I knew it was four, instead of just saying right in the middle, it's four. So the idea with this, the three words, or it's really the two things that are combined – you're getting people to use their own mental mind maps of what they already know to try to like create a puzzle of what you're doing. So if I say I'm the black belt of branding or if I'm a blacksmith of branding, you have your idea uh, of what a blacksmith is. You have your idea of what a black belt is. That's taken you years to really establish that mental mind map. And now I can tap into that and I can – get you to come up with what you think I do. That's why people like crossword puzzles. That's why people like to watch the edited versions of the movies. That's why people like to use their brain. So if you just like feed people exactly what you want them to, to think, it's boring. But if you give them like a riddle or a puzzle and they actually get to think about it, it gets them thinking. It gets them engaged. And the most powerful thing that happens with the 313 is that you actually put your idea in someone else's head. And that's really where like it's powerful. So that's that final three then for the math, and forgive me, it's it's been a long week, is you've got these two elements making metaphor, these yep. two plus two, things that don't seem to go together, the blacksmith of branding. You bring them together to make a more powerful third thing, and that's where your audience gets to knit these concepts together and come up with their aha moment. Yeah, so that's the three words. It's really like like for you, maybe you're the Merlin of storytelling. Mm -hmm. Right. And it, it just captures in your moment, in that moment when you hear it, you think about Merlin, you think about magic, you think about storytelling. And like now I've got this like magical vision of you telling stories. So the 313 in itself as a structure is an exploratory uh, method that gives you the tools to communicate more effectively. So you can explain your business in three sentences, the problem you solve, the solution and the market. There you go. If you have a shorter amount of time or you're meeting people and it's a you know, a casual environment where there's not room for conversation and you just kind of have to say what you do, you can say, this is the problem I'm solving for these people and here's how I do it. And you have six different varieties of that. Then if you have even a shorter amount of time or it's a, it's something that you want to engage people to get them curious about what you do and get them to create their own perception of what you do, you can use two elements in comparison to each other that's not a tagline to get them thinking. And then they'll be like, hmm, so what does that really mean? And now you have the ability to sort of jump back into, well, it's the problem that I'm solving or it's the solution or I'm really catering towards this market. So they, the, the fluidity between all of the elements gives you this bag of tricks when it comes to communicating your ideas. Oh, it's great. I'm just blowing through this, writing down my own as I'm going through the 313. All right, so, so, real, so real quick, let's do it. Uh, what yeah. is the problem that you solve? Companies and people that are ignored fade away into oblivion. Okay. Then what is your solution? Solution is to teach them the bewitchery of storytelling that actually connects them to people in a human way to clarify their story and amplify their impact, to grow them. Okay. So my question is, does your solution solve your problem? I believe it does. I mean, okay. it, it, in my experience, I might not be articulating it as well as I could. But yes, you know, when people are out running businesses and they can't cut through the clutter and rise above the noise, they essentially are ignored by the market and their customers and they fade away into oblivion. And nobody on a personal level or a business level wants to fade away into oblivion. 
Okay. So it's, it's amazing because sometimes people, the problem that they solve is not directly correlated with the solution, or at least how they're mm -hmm. communicating. So mm -hmm. it's always good. to It's like a litmus test too. So you've got the problem, you've got the solution, and who is your market? My market are typically what I call uh, mid-market companies. They are business people that have a great business model, are making money, but realize that the market is, is outpacing them too much competition and they are not connecting like they need to be to be successful cool so you could you could you could tighten that up right yep yep but, but at least you know that's good so try um, first let's talk about a structure you have six different ways so let's choose this and then fill in the blank so um, what structure do you like the pr this is the problem I solve for these people and here's how I do it or let's start with the market Okay, so for these people who have this problem, here's what I do. That's your structure. Yep. So for entrepreneurs that have a purpose-driven brand but are being ignored in the market and suffer falling into oblivion, I teach them the bewitchery of story to connect on a very human level, clarify their story, amplify their impact, and ultimately simplify their life when it all comes down to it i get people to actually give a shit about your purpose-driven brand okay good now i think you could have stopped it at at the at the story i help them understand the be of story period mm -hmm. okay but that like that was a really good job you had these people have this problem and here's how i'm solving so just to challenge you okay let's flip it and say this is what i do uh yeah. for these let's just change it random like uh let's do this is what i do for uh, these people who have the no, – let's do it even harder. This is what I do to solve this problem that these people have. This is what I do. I teach them the how to use the bewitchery of stories to help their purpose-driven brand stand out, be noticed, and have the impact that they are gunning for. For And then the problem because right now they're not being noticed. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah, exactly. but, see, but see how fun that is. Like you, you can do this, and now, now you can very in a very cohesive unit, you can package it together, which you could easily spend five minutes explaining. And yeah. the less time that you spend explaining, the more time you have them to ask questions and get engaged and really get to know them. So let's let's jump to the three words. Um, not a tagline. What's something like? Um, are you the the in and out of storytelling well I, I really like the one you actually came up with the merlin of storytelling um uh, there because i am a big huge believer in the magic that is story i've seen it in story structure i've seen it how leadership uses it uh, uh how purpose-driven brands can really connect and so that idea of the merlin of storytelling is fascinating okay so here, here's your challenge when you when you get up on stage to do your your social media marketing world <laughs> yeah okay, and you're flush in the face and you're up there and everybody's clapping and then you just it becomes silent they're waiting for you and say i want you to think about me as the merlin of storytelling. And at that moment, in every in all those eight hundred to eight thousand people, that fraction of a second, everybody knows Merlin. They're all gonna be preset with this thing that there's something magical. It's gonna be fun. It has all the stuff they know it's about storytelling. And then you just go right into it. Or my other challenge, say, <laughs> I'd love to see this. I am think of me as the Merlin of storytelling. The problem I solve is blank. Or maybe just do the one sentence, right? Just get it mm -hmm. all out there. And then you're presetting all these people to know exactly you're the problem you're solving. They're going to identify whether it's them or not. The solution, they clearly know what it is you do. And, um, you know, all that fun stuff. See how exciting this is? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So now here's what I'm going to ask you. I need a doodle of the Merlin of storytelling that I can put on my opening slide. Done. For the event, Done. all right? Done. <laughs> Speaking of that, this has been this has just been phenomenal. You are a doodler. Where did that come from? When did you start doing your doodles? So I've always I've always been trying to sort of hone in on uh, drawing a certain type of person. And when I was in middle school and high school, it like it was a certain guy with ears and certain stuff, like just an actual person. And then it wasn't until I had a job at a mortgage company doing sales that I started to doodle while you're on calls or you're making calls, you're like bored. And I came up with this really simplistic figure that just sort of seemed to flow, just very simple. And then in the mortgage industry, 
you get leads based on how many loans you sell and you only sell as many loans as you close and you can only close the processing if you get things processed quickly. So I identified that the real, the real bottleneck in the process was the processor. So you'd go over and you'd be a low level person when you start off and they'd have a hundred files on their desk and they get to you after they get through all of that. So I started to get to know these processors, found out what they were interested in, and then I started to draw these little scenes with the stick figure on the front of my loans. So I'd walk in, I'd be like, hey, and I'd show it to them with a stick figure and I'd throw it in the barrel. And then they'd go fish it out of the barrel and then they'd process it. And that single act of drawing images and doodles for these processors, they started to process my loans. I started to get more leads. I started to sell more, and I ended up at like the top three of the company, taking me all over the world on these vacations, making all kinds of money, all because of the stick figure, right? <laughs> and then that's awesome. Yeah, and then it kind of went. And then it kind of went dormant. I would maybe use it for greeting cards and things like that. And then I had a really amazing opportunity to go uh, to a Tony Robbins event, and you know, when you have a chance to to basically be in front of and meet somebody who is that powerful. Um, he put a challenge to me and he said, I challenge you to do one thing that is – it'll take you years to do. And I also challenge you to do one thing that you can do every single day. And this was crazy because this is right at the point where I was, I was, I was wanting to build my brand. I had my um, – I, I had a Facebook and I had a Twitter from whatever, but I didn't have Instagram yet. So I was like, I know I have to be on Instagram, but I had no reason to be on Instagram. I didn't n- understand it. So I took that advice from Tony Robbins and I went, you know what? I can draw a stick figure every day on my Instagram and that's it. So if you go to my Instagram and you go two, two, two two and a half years, the first post is with me at, you know, at the Tony Robbins doing a jump sidekick in front of the flames. And then the next one is a drawing and a drawing, drawing, drawing. And two and a half years later, I've kept with it. So every day I draw a stick figure drawing because I was challenged to do it. And it's, it's amazing to see the opportunities (laughs) that have come from it. Well, it's so much fun. So as I mentioned at the top of the show, we are working together on this book, The Five Stages of Grief and Business Storytelling. It will go live on the 28th at Social Media Marketing World. You can download the free ebook. And it's been so much fun as I've given you the chapter headings and the content, what you come <laughs> up with, with some of these figures. You've even uh, teased them out a little bit on Twitter already. Yeah. So they've been shared around. So it's great fun. And you getting punched in the face by a bully, that was one of my favorite. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's all a part of the book. And we go through the five chapters. Chapter number one is denial. And I'm sure you see this all the time in your work, too. No, um, no, never. I get up in front of people, especially <laughs> really educated people, and they just say, you know, storytelling is just a stupid gimmick. It doesn't really work. So you got to teach them no and demonstrate to them. And I have fun ways of doing that. I will do that at, at Social Media Marketing World, demonstrate how their brain is making up a story, whether they like it or not. So if you are not intentionally telling a story, chances are your audiences are coming away with a completely different story mm-hmm. and making it up about you. That's what's so beautiful about your 313 process. It gets you really clear on your story so that they're not making it up and you become intentional about it. Yes. You know, number two is anger. Have you heard this? That's This is where the, the bully thing comes in. You know, um, I was telling this one day down at ASU and I had a bunch of engineers and PhDs in the room and they all sit there and they go, oh, communications, that's all soft skill, which in <laughs> translation is my technical hard skills can beat up your soft skills anytime. And my argument is if communication and storytelling is truly a soft skill, then why is it so freaking hard? <laughs> you know, so we take them through uh, with great story examples of how do you overcome that within yourself or with in an audience. Um, chapter number three, bargaining. I'll do anything, but don't make me tell a story. You know, I get that all the time in my workshops. Mm-hmm. Or if they do finally, you coax them up on stage, they say, uh, bear with me here. I'm really not a very good storyteller. So they're bargaining with the audience that, you know, don't hold me to anything. But I found is, man, when you go all in, and like you said earlier in the show, you find your vulnerabilities, you talk about the rough patches in life because that's all people care about they want to learn and live vicariously through you so that they can understand what they would do if they find themselves in the exact same position that's when you got to throw bargaining out the window and just go all in find the guts and the courage to you know uh to show it all to bear it all and it's amazing how you can connect with folks 
we get into chapter four then, depression. Mm. You know this one. <laughs> I have no good stories to tell. Everybody does. I mean, your your story when you're 10 years old, climbing up that ladder and Mrs. Calgucci. <laughs> Calgucci shows up and pays you 386 bucks or whatever to come and do that. You know, that is a marvelous story. And I want to get people to really be looking at these fundamental scenes. Stop looking for your overall story and start pay, paying attention to the scenes in your life. Because it's these moments, the, the moment you were sitting in the office with your bosses and you're just sure you're going to get fired mm -hmm. well two things happen one thing is no man we're going to actually promote you and give you all these programs but another thing inside of you said whoa i got to make sure that i got my brand platform down just in case this does go bad and yep. i'm out there doing my own thing so another moment a scene that's not an epic story but it's a scene that makes up the epic story of Ryan Fullen. So I ask people and give them examples in this book of how to look for these kinds of scenes in their lives. And then finally, in chapter five, it's acceptance. Here's what happens. Um, and I, I reveal a very reluctant storyteller who he and his partners, actually, he was a little bit more inclined to it, but his business partners were like, this storytelling stuff is just total BS. It doesn't work. And uh, he tells the story about how they applied it and what it has done for their um, software interactive firm up in Sacramento and the power of accepting story in your life and using it and how it then attracts the right people to you. You know, very much so what, again, what you're doing with your 313 program and, and just the work you've been doing out there helping entrepreneurs, you know, get to where they want to go through clarifying their story to amplify their impact. Yeah, if somebody wants to check out the uh, the 313, I, I put a lot of the information out there. It's on my website, ryanfullen.com. There's a button that says 313. There's videos that step you through it. Um, I, I'm so excited about it because – the more you and I can empower people to share their story in a shorter, more efficient, more effective way to help people connect, like the world will be a better place. So I, I'm just a doubt. so excited of what, <laughs> what you're doing and uh, – yeah, I'm, I'm super pumped to be in the audience, and I'm just visualizing the Merlin of story, how I'm going to draw that. We'll, we'll get that done. <laughs> awesome. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for being here on the show. It's just been fascinating, and man, what a download of great ideas to clarify our story. Cool. And then one last plug. If you dig public speaking and communication, I've got a podcast called The World of Speakers where I interview amazing people from around the world and I get them to divulge all of their information because everybody's got an amazing story. And the more stories you hear, the more stories you'll know, and the more you'll be able to tell your own story with confidence and change the world because you are an epic story. Isn't that the truth? And you know what? I've got to listen to that too and get your tips on doing a TED because I get to do my very first TEDx Gilbert coming up March 24th here in Gilbert, Arizona. The theme is all about identity. You know, where are you and where are you going? So it's just perfect in our wheelhouse. And my uh, message, my presentation is going to be stop looking for the stories and start finding your scenes that are uniquely and authentically you. So I've been Love working it. with... Tamson Webster, who is just phenomenal, you know, she's producer of TEDx Cambridge out in Harvard, and um, she has been helping me and being my story coach to help bring that together. So I would love any tips that you've got. I'll buttonhole you over there in San Diego and get some tips on how you did your two yeah. TED Talks. And I got a third one coming up in Wisconsin, too. Right on, <laughs> right on. New topics every time? Uh, yeah, each one is totally new. This, this next one is going to be focused. Yeah. The next one is called... Why no one cares what you do. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Well, thanks, Ryan. And I'm really glad you're here. And I'm glad you all are listening and care about this edition of Business of Story. I'm here for you. If I can help you with your storytelling, download your tools, tips, and techniques at businessofstory.com. If you like what you're hearing here and you want to get more people to hear Ryan and share his approach to the 313 Share this episode with them, have them subscribe or jump over to iTunes and give us a rating and let us know what you think of the program. Thank you for being here. And remember, the most potent story you are ever going to tell is the story you tell yourself. So make it a great one, folks. See you next week.